This is Wednesday, May 24th, and I forgot to unfreeze my thing up there, so now we're just going to audit and talk over here. Hey, Wednesday, May 24th, this one is sixth period, which I think is the third one we've had a chance to put up there for today. She's right over there. You need to bring your bio book to Peterson. What are you doing? Oh, hey, it's like right there. Can you just like bring it in? No. No. Go whoa man Can up. Pick, uh, whoa okay. man up. Uh, I'm not at the end of the period. Go now. Faster. No, I don't want to. I know you don't. But choices. Uh, we live by them. the worst. Oh, I try to deal with it. Come on. Um, I got it. From there uh, <laughs> to go through it. <laughs> She's probably going to crack, so you can go ahead and crack the door so it makes slightly less noise, so probably not. Um, with what we're going to get into today, um, one, it's different than the previous days. The previous ones were stories I did, and today's not stories. Uh, the what, previous ones were easier for me to do and a lot less stressful because I just had to tap into the memories of what went through it. The problem with today is that it's advice, and my brain's going to jump around a lot. And normally, I'm pretty good at staying on topic and on point when I go through and teach, and that's going to be a little bit tougher for me. To try and help myself, and as confusing as it might be, I created an outline uh, that I was here until 11 o'clock last night trying to organize and get ready. And the drawback, of course, that is I'm a little on the sleepy side uh, because I need sleep. But we're going to see how it works. I tried to make it as efficient as possible. Um, so there, uh, seriously, and I left that over there? You guys are the worst. We can do it. Just accept the blame. I put things up there that are sort of help guide me as we get into this. All right. To give you a little start as, as we get into this and to do the talking, the ideas of what happens today and the emotions that come from it you guys are slightly different because you guys are my advanced class. And so I <coughs> tailor the talk slightly different for you guys because of who you are compared to who they are. Because you don't have the same life experiences necessarily in front of you. Or at least, that's what I used to think. And I used to change the talk a lot more. And then I realized I shouldn't because... I was wrong about what is in some of your futures, which I'll talk about here in a moment, because that's what today is, is talking about some of those futures. My goal is for this talk today to be completely worthless. Uh, I mean that in the best way, because my goal today is to help guide you on the correct path and to put you in the direction that I want you to be to achieve happiness. And for today to be most effective would be for you not to have those temptations in the first place. But I don't know if that's true. Because I used to think my advanced kids were ones that didn't have to worry about the bad things happening to them and those bad paths. But that's not the way it is. And there's a lot of kids in my advanced classes who have bad paths in front of them, which I'll explain more about. For some of you, today's talk will not land at all. What I mean by that is it'll have very little effect on you. And that's okay if it does. Because it means the things I'm talking about, you have no experience with. The problem is, I know there's kids in here who this is going to have a much bigger impact on. The trick is, I don't know who those kids are. I used to think I did. I used to think I could look at a kid and pinpoint and know what your future is going to be and what path you are going to be on. But I don't. I've done this for 18 years, and I've seen enough kids to come through to know that I don't know. That the kids I've seen who I thought were had everything together and were going to do wonderful in high school fall apart and, and drop out. Uh, in my advanced classes, I've had advanced kids get to high school and not be able to cut it and drop out. And I've had my kids that were in my slow kid section and didn't turn in homework and be failures turn around and be the top kid and the top student in their senior year because they figured things out. But I don't know which ones of you that's going to be. So that's why I give the talk to all of you. With the hope that at least one, two, three of you, this talk has an impact for. For the others of you, 
is simply going to be educational and open your eyes and hopefully point you in a certain direction. I didn't used to do these talks. Um, for the first several years of my teaching, I didn't do these because one, I've never seen them done. It wasn't something I'd ever witnessed another person doing. And I did what most teachers do. I showed movies at the end of the year. And there's two reasons why teachers show movies at the end of the year. One is because we have a lot of homework we have to do that you don't see that's behind the scenes. Friday is a teacher work day because we have to be here doing work all day long. Teachers don't want to do homework any more than you do. But if you don't do homework, you get an F. If we don't do our homework, we don't come back next year. So we have to do our homework. So part of that is teachers show movies because while you're watching that movie, we're sitting there getting our work done. The other reason why teachers show movies, y'all are a little crazy this week. Mm -hmm. And you're a little chaotic. And trying to control you is exhausting as a human being. So if we can put a flickering screen up in front of you and have you just drool to it, it makes our life that much easier. And us being humans, we like the easy path. And so that's what I did for a long time. Until about six years into my teaching. And it was after school. And I was sitting at my chair working on something when there was a knock on my door. Uh, and I said, yeah, come on in. And it was a past student. Um, I hadn't had her in years. She was in high school. And it completely threw me off. And I was like, uh, hey, what's going on? And she just leaned in. She's like, can I come in and talk? And I was like, sure. And she did. And she sat down. I was like, is everything okay? She's like, yeah, I just wanted to talk. She's like, I saw your car in the parking lot. I was like, what? She's like, it's on the wall. Uh, I had my, the, it's not there now, but the whole pictures of me, my car is up there. And apparently she paid attention to it and she saw it in the parking lot. And I was like, sure, okay. And she just sat down and just wanted to talk. And we did, like an hour and a half, just about life, the choices, how school was going, how the past had gone, how eighth grade was, what her thoughts on things were. And it was great. I never just sat and talked to a kid like that. And I really enjoyed it, but I'd never done it before. Uh, and I'd never done it with a teacher when I was a kid. So the whole time, it was weird. But we got done, and I was like, do it again sometime. I'm like, you're welcome to come back. She's like, thanks, I really enjoyed it. I was like, okay. And out she went. And the next day I was teaching, and I just had to stop. And I was like, hey, I got to take a time out. I'm like, what? And I was like, weirdest thing happened yesterday. And I go, what? And I go, uh, a kid came back from high school to come talk. And they went, why? I go, I don't know. Uh, she just wanted to come in and like, hang out and talk about life. And I go, did you? Went, yeah, for like an hour and a half. I'm like, oh. I go, is that weird? And they go, yeah, that's kind of weird. I was like, I thought so too. Then I had a kid go, can anyone do that? I'm like, what? Like, can anyone just come in and talk? And I was like, I guess. That's fine. Um, and so you did check in and talk first, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And so I said, yeah. I was like, I have no problem with it. I was like, I think it's kind of weird. Uh, and it sort of went from there, because when I was in school, I didn't have a teacher that I connected with. I didn't have a teacher that I would go and talk to after class. I didn't have a teacher that I would come back and visit in eighth grade. When I was in high school, I had no teacher that I wanted to go back and see again. I had a teacher I enjoyed, but not one that I had any kind of connection with. So the idea of doing that was weird. But it happened again later that year with a different kid. And it happened more the next year when these kids became eighth graders. And it started happening more and more. And it changed how I teach. Because the more I talked to these kids, the more I learned about their lives. Because I'd ask them, how is life going? What is it teachers have done well? What is it teachers do poorly? What is it that you liked about my class? What is it you didn't like? And what they told me, I changed or I kept. And I took every bit of advice they gave me and did what I could with it. But what happened was, I found out that Bad things happened to kids that I was not aware of. That it was the summer between 7th grade and 8th grade for a lot of kids where they started being first exposed to drugs. Where they had the first time they were somewhere and they knew someone doing drugs. Or they had that first time where they got invited somewhere where they knew someone was going to be drinking alcohol. Or they had that first time where they got introduced to something along those paths. And for a lot of kids, it was between 7th and 8th grade. For even more kids, it was at some point during the course of 8th grade that it happened. And prior to this, I'd always thought that 7th grade was this land of innocence and leprechauns and rainbows, and everything was happy. And that's not how it was. 
And as I started talking to my kids, I realized that I have a lot of students in seventh grade who are already exposed to it. Who I have seventh graders this year right now that I've had conversations with who are exposed, who have been to a place where there was someone smoking pot, where they were at a place where they know another kid who was drinking, and they're already exposed to those paths. And I realized that you're not little kids that I always like to imagine you being, which is even tougher for me now because my oldest daughter is going to be here next year, and I still see her as a little kid. So I absolutely understand how your parents see you as little kids and how they want to keep you as little kids. But the trick is, the world doesn't care. The world's not going to see you as little kids. And because of that, I realized I had to do something about it. Just put it on my desk. I go, I'll take care of it. Thank you, kiddo. One of the drawbacks to how I teach um, is I care. Uh, you can't spend time with kids as much as I do and not start to like you guys. And one of the drawbacks to liking you is caring about you. And the drawback to caring about you is not wanting to see you in pain. Anybody you care about, you don't want to see them in pain. So I had these kids coming back and talking to me who were in pain. Uh, and I had kids who come back to talk to me who were pregnant, freshmen in high school, sophomore. Uh, and these kids who would drop out, they were 16 and they were sophomores. And they were smart kids when I had them, and they dropped out. Uh, and kids who were getting arrested or were at parties where they were getting drunk. And they came back, and kids were honest with me. It opened my eyes. And I was like, you don't have to tell me. It's like, I don't mind. I'm like, okay. And they told me things that my hair blew back so far, it's gone. Uh, and so because of that, a lot of, now I have kids who come back and tell me about happy things. I mean, I love the kids who come back and talk about happy things. But it's the kids who talk about the unhappy things that open my eyes. And I realized I was doing things wrong because I was spending the last week of school wasting it. Having kids watch a movie, and this is where we used to watch, like Outsiders or something like that, and we'd spend that last week having that discussion. But that's not what I should be doing. I should be trying to make an impression on you, because this is my last time to do that. My last time to try and make a mark on you before you leave. Because after today, the only interaction I have with you is by your choice. And if you don't choose to interact with me, I'll never see you again. And so... I didn't want to waste that. So I decided to change. And so I started having talks at the end of the year. And that's what this talk today came from. And I realized, for this talk to have weight, I have to earn your trust. And I have to earn your respect. Which is why I do everything throughout the year. It's aimed at earning your trust and earning your respect. Because if I don't earn your trust and respect, my words carry no weight. And you shrug it off. I know that because if another teacher said, I want to talk about my past life for an entire week of school and then tell you about what you should do with your life, many of you would revolt and flip over desks. But the fact that you don't when I say that means hopefully I have earned your trust, which is why I did that. Why I've told you the stories the past several days about me getting arrested was to open my heart for you to understand where I come from, that I've been in those places. It's why I have done everything in my room to try and earn that bit from you, to try and help you out. Talking to kids has allowed me to see the future in a weird way. And what I mean by that is I've had enough kids come through that I can connect almost every single one of you to a past student who you remind me of. And oftentimes more than one student. And I can see those kids who made good choices and poor choices. And every single one of you has two paths in front of you. A path of good choices and a dark path. And those paths are not the same size for each person. For some of you, the good path is really, really wide. And it's so wide, you barely see that dark path and you don't have to worry about it. And realize that dark path takes different forms. For some kids, the dark path is not doing homework, leading to dropping out of school. For some kids, that dark path is going to parties that are over their head that they shouldn't go to, and being exposed to things that they shouldn't be, or getting that first chance to try alcohol. For some people, that dark path is dating people who are older than them that are going to expose you to things that you should not be exposed to. For others of you, 
that dark path is anger and rage because of things going on in your life and you don't know how to control it. Everybody's dark path is different. But we all have that dark path. And each one of you has this good path and dark path. And I can look at you, and for many of you, I can see what happens to you down both those paths. Because I can look at you, and I can bring up the name of a kid who is in that spot, who took the dark path, and did not become the person they should have been. And I can look at you and see a path for a person who chose the right way and did what they were supposed to. Um, and when you care about someone, it's really hard to not want to try and help them, to not bump them onto the good path. So what I'm doing today is trying to bump you onto the right path. For some of you, it is only a slight nudge because your path is so big. For others of you, all of my bumping and nudging might not be enough. But I'm going to try. The reason I appear so happy in front of you guys throughout the day is because I'm a happy person. But I did not come from happiness. I come from a place of pain uh, and heartache. My childhood was not a good one. Although I love my parents, and I've mentioned multiple times, I love my parents. Um, I come from a place where my father abandoned me when I was five years old and wanted nothing to do with me and just disappeared uh, and, went, and went off into his own thing. I've not seen him since. And my mom got remarried. And I had a stepdad who I loved very much. And they got divorced when I was 16. And I had a new stepdad. And I come from a place of addiction. Not for me, thank God. But every person I've loved in my life has almost been down that path. From one way or to another. All the way up to my grandparents. Where I couldn't be around my grandparents in the evening times. We'd go over to visit. And we could only visit in the afternoons. Because the evenings, my parents were so drunk. Uh, that they were obnoxious. I couldn't go out to dinner with them. I don't have memories of going out to dinner with my grandparents except for once we got thrown out because it was so bad. Uh, and same thing with my uncle. And I tell you that because I know what heartache and pain is. I know what it's like to have that rough childhood. I've been there. And I'm okay. It's possible to come from heartache and pain and find goodness. It's possible to rise above it. It's not easy and it's a struggle but you can do it. Because some of you have that. Um, and if it's not you, it's people near you. And if it's not in this class, I guarantee it's in your class throughout the day. There are kids who are struggling more than you can possibly imagine and having a tough time more than you can possibly imagine. But I control my outlook on life by choosing how to react to things. And I choose to smile. For those of you from camp, and for my cross-country team, I have a tattoo on the back of my leg. Uh, and it's a smiley face. And around the smiley face is uh, a snake. And it has a Latin phrase, which basically says, evil is around us at all times. And I designed the tattoo myself because I had to find a way to beat the evil that I saw around me all the time. And I designed it when I was 19 years old and in some pretty dark places. And I realized that I had to control my own life. And so that's why I designed the tattoo. The idea that there's always going to be evil around us. You can't get rid of it. Evil is always there. The bad things are always there. But you can choose how you react to it. And I choose to react to it with a smile. And I designed it, and I waited five years, because that was some of the best advice I ever got with a tattoo, was design something, wait five years, and if you still want it, then you should get it. Um, because there were a lot of bad tattoo ideas I came up with that I'm glad I waited five years, I do not have on me. But I got the tattoo coming up on 20 years ago, and still means just as much to me today as it did 25 years ago when I designed it. The idea that the evil around you you can face it with a smile. And it goes back to when I was a kid. Uh, I was dorky, and I was quiet, and I had a lot of acne. The kind of acne you see on people in the commercials, like bad acne. And I got made fun of and laughed at and called pizza face. And I remember one day I had a kid, uh, Chad Morton, who I hated, who was a bully. 
and was making fun of me in PE class and was calling me pizza face in front of these girls and trying to get them to laugh. And they did, and it hurt. And I remember going home that day and being upset and talking to my mom. And she saw how upset I was, and she was, what's wrong? And I said, I mean, Chad Moore was making fun of me, and he was calling me pizza face. She goes, oh, is Chad Moore a friend of yours? I said, no, I hate the kid. I hope he burns. And she goes, oh. She goes, so he's not a friend? I go, no. She says, then why do you care what he has to say? I said, what? She goes, if he's not a friend, why do you care what he calls you? I go, because he's really popular. Uh, and he said it in front of a bunch of girls. And she goes, oh, are the girls your friends? And I said, no, but they were cute. And she goes, oh, but they're not your friends? And I said, no. And she goes, then why do you care? Which is a very powerful way of thinking about things. And I didn't realize it at the time. And I wish I could say that I was all super duper good kid and I took it to heart and it changed me on that day. But it didn't. But the words did sit with me. Uh, and they sat with me for a while, for a number of years, because I kept getting bullied. But it helped shape me with the idea of when you're attacked, and you will be, bullying, being mean, is part of life. It's not going away. It does not matter what any school does, what anybody does, bullying will exist. Bullying exists because humans exist. Humans have pain. When humans have pain, it comes out. When kids have pain, it comes out in bullying which we'll come back to. But the idea of letting certain people control your view of yourself, that idea of why do you care what someone else says, helped make me a stronger person. Because when you give weight to what someone else says, you're giving them the power to control how you view yourself. The idea that a quote I saw one of those things that sort of stuck with me that no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. The idea that when someone makes fun of you, it only hurts when you let it hurt. It only makes you feel bad when you give them the power to make you feel bad. When someone makes fun of your weight, your height, your acne, who you are, your grades, the fact that you're outgoing, the fact that you're shy, whatever it might be, when they make fun of you for that, and you let it hurt you, you're saying their words have power. Why do you give them that power? Why do you let them control you? You have the power to decide who impacts your life. Figure out who your friends are. Figure out who is important to you. If they're not on that list of the people you think are important, of the people you respect, then their opinions don't mean anything. You can shrug it off. I know it's easier said than done. Because I was in that same place. But let that sit in you. Someday you'll have the strength to put those words into action. To be able to shrug it off. Because we're not going to get rid of bullying. And we're not going to get rid of evil people. They're always going to be there. But how you react to it, that's up to you. The tattoo, that smile, with evil all around you, it's always going to be there. Do you continue to smile to it, or do you let it beat you down? The reason I smile all the time is because that's how I choose to react to things. I have the same kids that every other teacher does, that every other grumpy teacher you see. I have those same kids. You look around in the classrooms. Why am I happy? Because I choose to be. It took a long time to figure that out, but it's something you have the power to do, to choose to be happy. With people who are bullies, I'm in a unique position because of who I am. Um, and I have the people who come and talk to me. Let me just put on my desk with a thank you here. Uh, with the people who come and talk to me, I have both... Bullies talk to me, and the kids who get bullied. I get to see both sides almost every time. And I have a lot of kids come talk to me. And I have a lot of kids who are very honest when they come talk to me. And it's shaped how I view things. And one of the ways it's shaped how I view things is to realize that no kid, no human, bullies from a place of happiness. When you are happy with who you are, when you are happy with your life, you don't attack others. It is impossible because it doesn't come from you. 
Bullying comes from a place of pain. It comes from a place of heartache and anger. And part of that is, as humans, we assume everybody comes from the same place we do. If we come from a happy home, we assume every kid has a happy home. But that's not the way it is. In this class, the majority of you, more so than some of my regular ones, probably come from happy homes. And what I mean by a happy home is you have two parents at your house who eat dinner with you at night, who tell you they love you, who give you hugs, who tell you they support you, who say that you can do anything you want to do. Um, because that's what parents are supposed to do. Parents are supposed to be supportive. Parents are supposed to do the job of being a parent. But when you look around throughout the day, there are kids who are not good kids. People who are not good kids grow up to be not good adults. Not good adults become not good parents. Not good parents have kids. Those kids are the ones you see. There's pain. If you're in a happy home where what's supposed to happen from a parent happens, that's good. And that is a good thing for you to have. But what you have to realize is there are people next to you who don't have that, who don't have two parents at home. Or if they do have two parents at home, those parents don't support them the way they're supposed to. Your parents are supposed to be a place of safety. Your parents are supposed to be a place you can go to for happiness. They're supposed to be there to discipline you, to tell you that you've screwed up, and no matter how badly you screw up, I'm going to support you. But there are parents who don't do that. And there are parents who are awful people. And there are parents who yell at their kids, who tell them you're a failure every day. And there are kids who go home, and there is no love there. And they go home, and there's no happiness there. And you have to realize, you're sitting next to those kids. How do you expect that kid to find happiness? How do you expect that kid to be in a good place when there's no happiness around them? Because you're 12, 13, 14 years old. And that's more pain than a kid should have. That's more pain than a kid's able to handle. And when that happens, it overflows. And it lashes out. And that's where you get bullied. That's where you get pain from. And that's not going away as long as we have humans. So what you have to do is learn how to handle it. One of the things that I read once that helped guide me was that one up there at the top. A child needs our love the most when he deserves it the least. But that's not just for children. That's for people. People need our love the most when they least deserve it. When people lash out and attack you and are awful and are mean, that's when they most need you to forgive them. That's when they most need you to be nice to them. And it's not easy to do. And I'm not saying hug them, because that's going to be awkward and creepy. What I mean is forgive them and realize when they lash out, when they attack, they're attacking you because that's their way of having you share their pain. That's their way of saying, I can't handle how horrible things are for me, so I share it with you. What they don't need from you is to lash out and be mean back. But it's so not an easy thing to do. When they lash out at you, forgive them and be strong. If you come from that happy home, if you come from that place where you don't have that pain, that's why they attack you. Because if you're in a place with that much pain and that much unhappiness and that much anger and you see someone who is happy, who has everything going for them, it's hard not to lash out because that's jealousy. They might not put it into words, but that's jealousy because they don't have what you have. And as a human, they want that, but they can't have it. They can't change their parents. They can't change where they are. So they lash out and they're angry. I say that because it helps guide me as a teacher. Because you see the kids in class who are bullies, who are mean, who are angry, 
and do the things they should not do. And you wonder why sometimes teachers react the way we do. The good teachers understand that. But just like not every human is a good human, not every teacher is a good teacher. And not every teacher is a great teacher. And some of them don't understand that. But they try. So part of it is understanding the fact that teachers are also human. Um, part of why I run my class the way I do, and once again, this doesn't affect you guys as much, but it does a little bit, is holding you guys responsible when you make poor choices. Making you stand when you don't do homework. Making you move to the slow kids section when you've made poor choices. The reason I do that is because I care. Because when I do that, that is my way of saying I expect more from you. I expect you to be a better person than what you're showing. Here's the problem. There are kids who don't have adults in their lives telling them that. We have kids in the class who don't have adults who tell them, I expect more from you as a person. We have kids whose parents accept them as failures. And they're 12 and 13 years old. And the adults who are supposed to support them, the adults who are supposed to say, you can achieve more, instead say, you're a failure, and you'll never be anything more than that. Which is tough. So I don't accept them as failures but I don't know the home life of every kid. I don't know what goes on in every home, but I will hold each and every one of you responsible. And it's why I do what I do in the classroom. Because I don't know when it's gonna be that's the one kid where I am the only adult holding them responsible. And it's easy to give up on kids as a teacher. And when you guys get to eighth grade, and for those of you who currently are eighth grade, you will see it. The teachers who give up on kids and stop trying to connect with them, stop trying to make them do their work, and say, I accept the fact that you're a failure. And I don't want that for any of my kids. Even the ones that annoy you, and I know each of you has kids here at the school that bother you, that annoy you, that kid that you think is the bad one that's in the classroom. But you have to understand where they're coming from and the pain they're going through too. And the fact that that's what I try to do. I try to understand where they're coming from, and I try to help guide them. Soon, as I mentioned before, I have until 1.50, right? So I have 10 minutes, perfect. Those paths in front of you that I mentioned before, they're gonna start coming soon. Uh, and this is where I thought with my advanced kids that those paths were not there. Uh, and so I would give a different speech that was not nearly the same or as strong because I assumed all of the kids in my advanced classes that your road was golden in front of you and that you lived happy lives. And then I realized that's not the way it is. And some of my advanced kids have even scarier paths than the kids in my regular classes. If you're at a place now where the idea of me talking about drugs, alcohol, teenage pregnancy, and stuff like that seems completely foreign to you and sounds like this make-believe thing that doesn't exist, I could not be more happy. I, it makes me ecstatic. But here's the problem. It doesn't last. I will tell you, by the time you leave 8th grade, you will know a kid who has gone down that path. You will know a kid who has tried drugs, or has drank at a party, or is doing things with a boy or a girl that someone should not be doing when they're in junior high. And you are going to know someone by the time you leave eighth grade. By the end of your freshman year, the very latest, maybe sophomore year, it'll be someone you know personally. It won't be a kid from class. It'll be someone you have spent time with. It is going to be someone you know, because that's how the paths work. And I wish I was wrong. Uh, and when I have my eighth graders come back and talk to me, and when I have my high schoolers come back and talk to me, one of the first questions I ask them, was I wrong? And on occasion I am, and I am absolutely excited, but it's rare. It is rare that I am wrong on that one. 
because that information comes to me from my past kids talking to me. So what I want you is to be strong enough when that choice comes, is to be able to find a way to control your life. I wish I could tell you it's an easy choice when confronted with it upon the two paths, but that would be lying to you. Uh, and 